Institute. I'd like to take a moment to thank my colleagues of the IFKI Luxury Committee for putting together this phenomenal initiative of bringing together the collective voice of the luxury industry in India, a grand premiere. It is also my great honor to open the first conversation today, wherein we will focus on the legacy that India holds in the world of luxury and its pivotal role in the future. India has seen an unprecedented growth in the past few years, uh, and it is offering a whole new world of opportunities. But not only that, it is also shaping the world of tomorrow. From heritage to modernity, let us speak about the relationship that India has from the past, present to the future. And it is my greatest honor to welcome someone on stage who needs no introduction. She is an icon and is the perfect incarnation of modernity and heritage. A very warm welcome to Priya Raja Sindhya. Thank you for being with us. Priya is the curator of Madhya Pradesh and is the Maharani of Gwalior. Luxury is in her DNA. Priya, over to you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much, Kavita, for having me here. It's an honor and privilege to be able to represent um, India as one of the voices in luxury. Um, as you know, France and India have had cultural ties going back to the 16th century. And so to be able to speak today at a forum talking about art, craft, culture, the communities that are based around that, the diplomacy and the interactions that we bring together through these is truly an honor for me. So thank you. Thank you. So let's go straight to our topic. With your legacy, your traditions, and your heritage, would you describe to us what luxury meant in generations past? So according to me, um, India was a country that where luxury was just a word that was part of your everyday. Um, you know, whether you talk about how you cook or what you serve in, whether you talk about your textiles, India was known to be a country where you could find diamonds at the banks of rivers. <clears throat> You've got um, some of the world's most amazing luxury brands like Cartier that are inspired enough by India to create necklaces like the Tutti Frutti. And for India, luxury is in its DNA. You know, uh, the way we celebrate, the way we come together, it's about communicating um, generosity with each other. And so for India to be talking about luxury is a very sort of common um, conversation, I feel, you know. Absolutely, I love that. It's a very fluent language. Luxury is a fluent language in India. It is not new. It's not new at all. And um, I think today when we talk about it with the emergence also of some amazingly creative people that are now being able to show their craftsmanship and India's artisans on different scales internationally, I think India is once again being spoken about in the language of luxury, you know, which it was hundreds of years ago as well. So, you know, what a great day for us to be here and speaking about this today. Luxury is a cornerstone of our history, as you said. It's deeply rooted in our heritage, but is also very relevant to the new India of today. Completely. I think we all um, sort of resonate with luxury also, as was said before, through memory and through experiences. So um, having those aspirational conversations with our parents or reliving momentous memories with our grandparents and talking about their travel, their adventure, their exposures, and also um, the time when they got to showcase, hundreds of years ago, this inherent DNA of, lux of the luxury of India to the international markets very early on. You know? And so India's always been one, and even today, I think, is a country that still inspires on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, there are still discoveries to be made. Um, I live in a state called Madhya Pradesh. And to me, um, every day a new craft being developed or being dis rediscovered, to me that is luxury as well. So India will always throw out all these amazing webs of design and architecture and jewelry. And by weaving those threads together, we open up the international market um, 
to absorb all of that immediately. If we have to remember really one point today, it's about this duality that India presents about heritage and modernity. To your point, Priya, what is the role, this important role that legacy plays in the transformation of tomorrow? How did the royal families, the royalty evolve? So um, if I may go back a little bit, I think when um, India became an independent country, um, we went through a great change in our fortunes as well. Um, it was a time when the country did go through a huge famine and then come 75 years later, um, again, once again, in this short span of time, we're being celebrated for the things we did. What's important to also recognize at the time was the fact that it was a time when new entrepreneurs from these erstwhile families of um, caretakers had to emerge to sort of create a new identity for them in a country that was initially theirs and then became a democratic country. So you had the emergence of business, you had it in hospitality, you had it in textiles. And this was also a great time for women to come out because you know suddenly the ladies who were ordering for, through crafters for themselves also realized it was an opportunity to showcase it to others. So you had all of this happening and coming up and whether it's public service, whether it was, as I mentioned, business, whether it was hospitality or the creation of luxury markets. I think that is the turn that India took at that time. And we see that even today. I mean, uh, my own son runs um, two startups, one based deeply on journeys um, through India, through heritage and culture. The other one is connecting tech to tier three and tier two cities um, through the application of food. So there are very interesting stories still coming up. You have the two princesses of Mayurbhanj who turned their beautiful property into a hotel today and are, being, uh, are the faces of what their families represented in the days gone by. So there are so many stories of um, this entrepreneurial talent that has had to come up, e even in the royal families of India. It's truly admirative how the royal families have evolved and become really so contemporary. They are the new Very contemporary. However, you're also sort of um, still looked at by the people that you live around with a lot of love and respect. So there's a lot of traditions, there is a lot of um, values that you still have to protect and because of the sentiments of the people that still live around you and still have huge expectations. So you have this responsibility of being the guardians of the legacy Definitely. and unique crafts and lifestyle as well. Exactly. The beginning of our conversation, I had mentioned that luxury is in your DNA. What does luxury mean to you personally, Priya? I would love to hear that. Um, I think being a part of this forum, I, um, I, it's, it's very easy for me, and I think a lot of people here will resonate with that. For me, luxury is definitely the things that make my life easier. It's definitely, um, not about overthinking something, but understanding what quality and heritage is also about. The ability to um, spend the money on the things that I think are the most important to make my life easier. Um, also to me, time is one of my biggest luxuries. The fact that as soon as I get some time, I'm able to spend it with my family, I'm able to spend it with the people that matter most and spend it doing um, a lot of things that are very creative. So to me, those are my luxury items at the end of the day. The, the dinners with my husband, the cookouts with my son, and of course, sometimes weaving with some of the weavers in Madhya Pradesh. How about the Trinity story you told me this morning? Yes, so um, we were discussing a few of the pieces of, a um, few items of luxury that um, are special to me and I was mentioning to Swagata that my engagement ring was a Cartier Trinity and a lot of people obviously expected me to have this one big ring when I got engaged but I think the most special thing for me was the fact that it was the Trinity even though we all know it's gold but in India the significance of the three metals um, 
coming together and building that aura and that strength was something, was a story that also was very special to me. So luxury is deep rooted in our culture because of that, because um, India also has one of the oldest texts on gemology, um, which tells us, you know, which stones we can wear, which stones we can consume, which stones we should avoid. So there's that history and legacy of everything precious, whether it's metals, whether it's spices, whether it's textiles, it's all here. And it'll continue to be here. We're not planning to export that, I think, anytime soon. I think there's something utterly organic between luxury and India. Definitely. It's embedded in our DNA. Definitely. And this is where I think we have some wonderful takeaways for luxury brands, especially Western luxury brands who aim to achieve success in India. We have to invest in time, in relationships, to your point. And also, I mean, it was wonderful to have, you know, Dior Showcase do their fashion show in India recently, and also be able to own the fact that a lot of their embroideries were created in India, which has not been done that much in the past. And India being at that space today where we are able to say, well, we do the best. So come and um, experience the best that we do. Whether you talk about hospitality, India has some of the finest properties in the world. However, apart from that, we also have a deep rooted value system of Atithi Deva Bhava, which automatically roots us in generosity and the spirit of community and sharing. So I think that has you know, a huge impact that even international luxury brands need to keep in mind, that India is about generosity. And if you come in, you're generous to learn, you're generous to seek, you're generous to experience, India will always welcome you and welcome you with open arms and you will learn the India way soon enough. And the value of craftsmanship, the stories that we need to believe in, because you know from the outside world, we want to tell contemporary stories now, but there's this wonderful duality again, which is India's strength about heritage and modernity. So I mean, definitely. I mean, you're talking about craft stories. Um, for me to wear a hand-woven sari, it's one year of a man's or a crafter's life that they've spent maybe weaving it in a little town with very little electricity sometimes and I've spent a year now, if I think about it, with this crafter's family because I've been through the good times, the bad times, while they've been weaving every emotion, every memory, every crisis, and every celebration is woven into the sari. So for me, I mean, to be able to wear it today to this occasion and to represent a crafter so purely and finely is an honor, really. So that's, again, a takeaway for international brands. Bespoke is in our DNA. It is not only for the creme de la creme, it is for every class of the society and we understand this language very well. This makes me think about the luxury consumer of today, Priya. Who are they, what are the expectations and is India ready for this shift? So from what I've seen through obviously my own children and their friends and um, how shopping or the, the owning of luxury is concerned. I think, first of all, the emergence of women being able to come out and um, own something um, by themselves without having to wait for it to be bought for them, I think that is a huge shift altogether. Although India has always, always had a very, very strong luxury, um, history of women being the preservators of craft. So our history as most are, is written by men for men. So what happens is the stories of women sort of ordering those beautiful pieces because they were paid for by their representatives, which were usually the men, but the designs of them, the fact that every uh, celebration or puja or function, you had to create a beautiful sari, you had to create beautiful jewelry, you had to sit and create the most intricate menus. I think that is the legacy of women in India. The change has come where we don't need to be represented when it comes to paying our bills. So automatically, uh, women going out and being able to buy luxury for themselves, I think that's become even more apparent. I think um, 
the fact that we already know what we want, we have a lot of it already, and we just want to go out there and create those little pieces of memory, even if they are for ourselves. So for me, I think to see that happening is great. Also the onset, as you discussed previously, of technology. You know, um, already because of technology, um, something that could have made me nervous to walk into a designer store and even ask what the price is of something. I think those barriers have come down because I'm able to buy online and I'm also able to check prices online. So it's opened the doors to luxury for women also who maybe didn't go out. At the same time, as we discussed, men are great consumers of luxury, even though they keep blaming it on women. But, um, you know, it, it, it's true uh, even today, and it's been true in India for um, hundreds of years. I think, uh, you know, the men sometimes had the better necklaces and the better diamonds than the women did. But it's nice to see that change now, and it's nice to see women going out and um, rewarding themselves for the kind of work that they're doing in society. So that, to me, is a huge change in India, definitely. That's a great game changer. It and is. for men, I think it's a full circle. Like, well, It's time to step back and watch us doing the shopping. It's a luxury audience today in India. Also, the fun thing being that I'm able to buy my husband a ring instead of him buying me a ring. So that's interesting, too. That, this one we love. <laughs> I think the Indian luxury consumer is changing phenomenally. They are young, they're making decisions. Definitely. And they are rewarding themselves. But they are also as much proud of their heritage as much they are of the future. So this duality again that I'm coming back, which is a key point of our session, is this whole conversation of past and present, which is very anchored in India. I think the beauty of India is the fact that our values and our history is integral to who we are. And there's that famous saying that says, if you don't know your past, you can't make a future. So when you have um, such a strong value system with family, with um, relationships outside family, automatically you know, you're able to have a much stronger base to build that future and invest in that future. So I think that is a really important part of the India story. It's a great strength, I think. Let's continue to speak about India's strength and conclude our conversation with one last question. What are your thoughts about India and the world stage? And what are the key learnings we can really take away about India's strengths? So I think, again, going back to the 16th century, we have always, always inspired each other and the West in many, many ways. Um, that may have sort of lessened a little bit in the middle, but I think today we are back on track. Um, when you talk about either foreign investments, whether they are happening in India or invest, India is investing um, outside the country, there is a huge change in that. And it's amazing to see where India is today. However, India has always been ready. We've always been a country that's so ready to showcase and to talk about our culture and to talk about our food and our history and our people and the vibrancy of it. We were talking earlier today about luxury and about you know, showcasing. In India, it doesn't matter who you are. When you have a wedding in the family, everyone is invited, you know, you have the best foods, you have the best representations of your culture, and that is the vibrancy of India. It's not about tier one, tier two, tier three. It's about the celebrations of all three when they come together. And India will showcase that to anyone at any time. And so we're always sitting with open arms to showcase the world as to what we do best, and that is tell our stories beautifully, capture our culture, and be able to show it to other people. And I mean, interestingly, one of India's greatest exports being yoga. You know, so we're talking about luxury at a very, very base level, India's export of cotton in the 1800s. You know, the simplest, most genetic, generic textile is celebrated internationally even today. 
So that is India. And today, even more through technology and through the opening up of social media and mediums, through young people who are putting their stories out there, representing India, whether, like you said, on TikTok or Instagram or all these other mediums, the world is able to take a peek into this beautiful country again. Look at the fauna, I mean, the, the wildlife, the textiles, the food, the masalas, the, the languages. Um, you know, it's so normal for most of us to speak three different languages in our country. You know, and that's the beauty of India. That's what ties us, and that will always keep us strong. And that's something that I feel the West will always try to look at and appreciate. Because when, they, when anyone comes to India, it's about generosity and warmth. And to your point, there is an India in India and there is an India outside India now who are the flag bearers of this generosity and tradition. Definitely, and like we discussed, they are deep rooted in India. I mean, some of them in, in the US, for instance, we had one of the biggest Hindu temples opening up recently. So there's a celebration of India internationally uh, politically, uh, it, through commerce, through luxury, through design, through so many different forums. And I mean, it's just time, I think, for us as Indians also to take a turn back and reflect on the greatness and the diversity of the strengths of this country. Indian you know, um, we also, for instance, have someone like you uh, representing Katya. We have someone like Alina Nair representing a Chanel today. I mean, these are women who are in the forefront of international luxury brands. That has to speak something about where India is going, you know? So I think that's where we have to keep pushing these conversations and relive those journeys and those ties that we've had with France or with other countries as well, because they go far deeper than just the commerce or the diplomacy. Thank you so much, Priya. The Indian diaspora is vibrant, is affluent, and is influential, and are definitely making sure that we are a part of the India story definitely. and continue to contribute. Definitely. It has been inspiring. Thank you very much for your valuable in introspections. I think it is important and key takeaways that we can all have as luxury brands that India matters and we should take time to have a true conversation now with India. Thank you very much. Thank you.